Hello, film friends, friends of film, and everyone in between. Welcome to the Film Folklore Podcast. I am Jed Props, and I'm joined today by Zoe Props. Hello. And Justin Sound. Hello. Joe and Chris are not here. Shocking. Uh, Joe was reportedly at Neuschwanstein uh, Castle in Germany with Dr. Sarah Bellum. Uh, Zoe, where's Chris? <laughs> Chris is lost in the basement in said castle. <laughs> It's like he's got a little map and his headlight has gone out. He they're doesn't almost know what like, to do, man. They're almost like ships in the night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> Just on mm -hmm. different stories of, of a German castle I never knew how to pronounce until today. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Um, don't ask me to say anything else in German. Um, <laughs> so um, today, um, as uh, the title would suggest, uh, we have scenic guests plural. Um, it's our first uh, dual interview and our first couple. We have a married couple uh, here today and they are going to give not only a little window into their crafts, but also uh, we get onto the fun subject of uh, dating relationships and being married in the industry, which uh, is something we haven't really touched on, but it's definitely, um, uh, I think, an important and uh, interesting aspect of our industry because of our crazy hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm getting nonsense, Zoe. Um, <laughs> I was uh, just thinking about all the couple friends that I have. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, uh, because we are going to get into the scenic world, uh, I just want to talk briefly about uh, art in general. Um, we've never really talked about it, but are either of you artistically inclined as far as like drawing, sculpting, um, anything? Yeah. Um, do you do you draw? Do you yeah. Okay. Right on. Yes, I do. I went to art school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to art school. Shit. When I was a kid, I thought that I would be an art teacher. Were you, were so. you a SCAD? Is that what we talked about? No. No, no. No, were, but I, I like was around SCAD, but no, right. I didn't go to SCAD. No. Would you Would you consider Charleston <laughs> to be on sister cities? I mean, they're, they're so close. No, I think Boston is actually Charleston's sister city. Really? Yeah. Huh. In technical whatever, ter whatever, whatever that actually means. Boston, Charleston are technically sister cities. Okay. Um, but Savannah they have is the same dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Savannah is similar, but it's not, it's not considered a, um, a sister. Is that so city talking about you, you drawing and everything. Is that something that you were just doing from an early age that you just had as an interest? Yeah. My mom's an artist. My father's a musician. So that was it something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was something just in my world. I like to draw. I that's know why, how to draw. That's why, that's why, that's why I feel like a fraud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why I feel like a fraud. I'm like, what do you mean you can't look at something and draw it? Uh, <laughs> it's easy. Talking um, about that. Yeah. Question that, uh, that I wanted to ask him that we didn't uh, have time for, but I'll ask you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you. Do you have siblings? Yes. And where are you in that lineup? The youngest. Okay. Yeah. All right. My, my, my joking question was, is everyone middle children? Um, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> but my niece is 12 years younger than me, so she kind of feels like a little sister, but I'm technically the baby. I got gotcha. you. She can't take that away from me. I kind of have that with my, with my cousin. She's more like a sister because uh, we're two years apart. And so, yeah, but I'm the youngest in my, in my world. Yeah. Uh, and my middle brother is the artist in the family by all stereotypes. Um, mm. and, uh, and Justin, you can relate as you just said. Um, mm. yeah. <laughs> um, did you have, uh, uh, art interest when you were younger? Or? I did. Yeah. Um, I also come from a family of artists. Yeah. My dad was a, a, a an artist, uh, and a, uh, and he did fine art restoration oh, his whole cool. life. For, cool. Yeah, um, for museums and churches and things like that. I uh, actually know a couple of people. Dope. Yeah. I, I have a couple of friends here in New Orleans, uh, non-industry people that do exactly that. They do mm -hmm. art restoration at the museums and everything. And yeah. when it's that, it's that ironic world because we're in an interesting industry that we take for granted because we're in the industry. And then everyone that's outside of the industry is always going like, Oh my God, film, what's that like? What's mm -hmm. a movie you've worked on? What's mm -hmm. a, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but for us, we, you know, we'll get geeky about say, like I meet these art restoration people, you know, doing the same thing as, as your dad. And then suddenly I'm full of questions doing exactly what I get annoyed by. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But it's cool. It's, it's cool, it's, man. I want to do that. I know. I wish I could do something like that. Yeah. Clean it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and then my, my uncle, uh, was actually the, uh, 
he was the treasurer of the local musicians union here in New Orleans. Oh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, and it, and he was he played music throughout his whole life, and so yeah, picked up on both of those guys. And um, what about you, Baxter. Jed? Are you an art boy? I I I think I fall into the category of I. I could have been better if I focused on certain things. I was always good with uh, like clay and things like that. I had a, a an interest um, in kind of like the pottery world. I always seemed to have okay. a, a decent knack, but it's just one of those things that was never fostered, so it never improved. But that's also kind of a <clears throat> I don't want to say expensive, maybe not as accessible as saying. Yeah, P uh, pen and paper, pencil and paper, it, yeah, true. whatever you yeah. know. A reason why I never really like painted a whole yeah. bunch. It's fucking well, expensive. I just, <laughs> like, I, I just went to the neighborhood know? kiln and. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I uh, loved pottery. I loved when I could be able to do that in uh, in school. That was always the coolest. But I was like, when am I gonna? <laughs> when am I gonna be so, around a kiln again? You know, I'm realizing. Uh, uh, a, a spoiler: We've already talked to Dave and Simon. That I, I should have asked him. Um, <laughs> They had a ghost moment with the uh, <laughs> the shared pottery <laughs> wheel. Uh, uh, oh god, missed opportunities. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I actually wanted to uh, give a shout out to uh, Warren Young. He's a production designer, and um, I, I still call him a friend. I, we haven't talked in a long time. Uh, I hope he's well if he happens to hear this. Um, I was a, a art coordinator when we met, and he. He actually convinced me that all forms of art, like anything else, can get better with practice. You know, like you might not be a Picasso, mm -mm. but you can definitely improve and get better with practice. And art's an intimidating thing, I think, that a lot of people go like, well, I'm not a good drawer. Like, no, maybe, you again, you're not going to be a skilled artist, but if you practice and stick with it, you actually might be a decent draftsman or something like Anyone that. Anyone can draw. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone. Anyone can draw. I do. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. I, yeah. It's yeah. the, uh, <laughs> I, really, I really do. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> practice. He, and, and my, the rap gift that he got me on that show was like basically a, a beginner's package for like sketching and everything. And, and his, his advice was, you know, just wherever you are sitting around or whatever, just find something that's around you and just start get, sketching it. And, uh, yeah. and so I do that as kind of a, which is also something therapeutically nice about it. You yeah. Know, when you're kind of in your own moments, but, um, but yeah. That and, uh, I don't know them, them talking about teachable, uh, <laughs> always being teachable. Yeah. I remember in, in school, I'd be around these kids who were good artists, uh, but they had their own style and they would draw in a certain way and they wouldn't take notes uh from the teacher or be willing to learn and i found that i, I hated that i hate it like you you could be better just do mm. the assignment you don't have to stop it where where you're i don't know at your level because you think that this is just good enough and it's like well you could just just learn it what, what a great just learn thing it. just draw it different it's for, okay for, uh, you could try Drawing in the lines. Yeah. 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 I'm like, I know you got your style and you're doing your thing and you're this tortured artist who's also a rebel, but like, why the fuck are you paying for this class or your parents are? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, you're making me think like uh, something every parent would love to hear from a teacher is that your child is unteachable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also a tortured artist. <laughs> yeah. What a terrible combo. Your kid sucks. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, eh. Anyways, um, uh, well, um, obviously we're talking art related because we have, uh, as, as you can see in the title and we've mentioned, uh, we have a scenic couple who's going to talk to us a little bit about plastering, mold making, sculpting, and uh, scenic painting. Uh, they do it all. And so uh, let's get into it and welcome them in today. So without further ado, let's welcome our first industry married couple, Dave and Simonette Scenix. Uh, Simonette and Dave, welcome. Welcome. Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the show, Dave and Simonette. Um, how are y'all doing? Great. We're good. Um, so we're just going to get going right away. Uh, to kick us off, um, can each of you tell us about your craft positions that you uh, have typically done? Um, well, let's see. I, I wear a lot of different hats. I started out as a sculptor plasterer. 
um, sculptor, foam carver. I apprenticed under a master sculptor, uh, Anthony Henderson, a great guy. Um, and then, uh, did that kind of about four and a half years and started picking up some plaster techniques, doing some stuff. I worked on, uh, expendables and, and every oh, time yeah. that I switched over, it was, it was mainly because of necessity. It, it's <laughs> like, we need you to go do this one thing or I, I, here are some new tools. Would you please go and try to figure them out? <laughs> it's like, okay. So, and we actually, uh, a buddy of mine thought that we were being, uh, like, grasshopper master like <laughs> train this whole show and we're like well the way that you showed us how to do that and you just kind of left us to our own devices and then you came back and you just grunted and 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 uh <laughs> gave us a couple pointers and then left us again that was really really i mean it just made us such better artists and and he's like i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> At the end of the show, we were thanking him and praising him. We'd built this whole thing, this uh, icon around him and what, he, you know, but we needed that, you know, to get through the show in the heat. And, uh, and then I guess it was around Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter that I started working for a man named Shane Buckaloo and his dad is Walt Buckaloo from like Fox Studios staff oh. shop forever. Like, oh, wow. he, he's like pretty big. And, um, Shane was this incredible or is this incredible plaster and knows all the old school ways of cutting plaster and making molds. And I basically started training under him and, um, really dialed into just like some old school processes. And, um, from there started making molds and started learning how to fabricate anything that the construction shop may need that they can't buy mm -hmm. um, from that position. Um, Simonette actually started teaching me a lot about scenic um, techniques and how to layer things and different solvents. And, um, and I, I was scared in every <laughs> single new craft that I got into and, uh, <laughs> and slowly like, you know, as many people do like kind of, uh, you know, fumble your way through it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was called not by Simonette, but, but other bosses, <laughs> uh, a hack on uh. a daily basis. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Dave, why is this like this? And, um, you realize there's supposed to be a two inch flange on this and this is not professional. <laughs> and what are you going to do? I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to put a new one on there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so from all those years of kind of trial and error, I actually got good at, good at getting out of bad, situations. That's so really cool. from that, um, it led me into kind of a leadership role. Um, I'm, I really would like more of the Zen, less stress, like be, I'm really looking forward to be an old person where I'm like <laughs> talking about back in the day as I'm pushing a broom and they don't know that I was like uh, in, in charge of something <laughs> other than the broom. But, uh, for right now they keep on putting me in these positions of, uh, leadership. So I'm a people wrangler now <laughs> more than anything in a back rubber. Yeah. So to speak, no, no contact, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll keep them nameless, but there's a lead man that I, I, when I used to do set dressing that, uh, he would get off the phone with a decorator and be like, I'm more of a therapist than I am <laughs> a lead man. <laughs> yeah. You have to learn to listen. Yeah. Like definitely listen. If, especially if you have a lot of people and it just so happens like on this show that I'm working on right now, we have 30 painters and scenics. Oh yeah. It's a, that's a big, yeah, yeah. it's a, it's, it, but we have a great team. Everybody is like, like a family, even people that are new. We brought in a lot of like really incredible, uh, talented people from other crews. Uh, the blessing of being the only one of the only games in town is you get the best players from all the other oh, teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we really have like stacked the deck with just like the most incredible cards there are. And, um, and everybody has their own little ways and you and and to be mindful and sensitive to what people need and to listen to them and to make sure that the most important part of my job is to insulate people from stress and to be the lightning rod from things that are going to come from above and to gather information and tools and materials for the people that are 
needing them to do their excellent work to make us all look good, no matter where we're at. So. Yeah. And you, you touched on uh, mental health, which we can get into in a little bit too. Uh, but that's something that's been kind of a, a welcomed change, I think, in, in our world. When you think, uh, we've talked about it a little bit on the show, but <clears throat> the some of the more old school people maybe um, uh, came up in a different era or a different, you know, we, we, I was talking with a coworker the other day about how we used to see tantrums on a regular basis and <laughs> adults yeah. having yeah. tantrums is yeah, not was, an attractive yeah. thing ever. Yeah. Um, I and, love it. It was a status thing. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel so comfortable. And I mean, if, it, if <laughs> when you're doing them, or, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing more horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, it's called expressing yourself. Yeah, you mean as like a third person observer? But, yes, yeah. of course. You want to give them a warm bottle and a nap, but yeah. kiss them on the yeah. forehead. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> I agree. Um, Actually, I've, I've been having a lot of conversations about this. Um, I feel like when, you know, when you, I, I have 17 years in, so um, I was there when the first rider strike happened. I was there oh, yeah. um, when um, oh, eight. the influx of uh, LA, uh, I, I say cats all the time, but you know, it's folk, mm -hmm. um, came and started training us but they weren't really intending on training us it was like a byproduct of uh really like using the local force mm -hmm. and like kind of leaning on us a little bit uh for, for what they had to do uh you know i'm not saying that we're exploited and all that kind of stuff not that negative but because it was definitely a blessing but but not realizing the relationship we had with work here and the relationship they had with work there was different, but very much the same. We are capable of almost doing everything because we don't have the resources to like um, prioritize one craft or another. So our studio mechanics are multifaceted in order to stay relevant. Whereas their um, area expertise might be the only craft that they ever do. And the cross craft is not so much. So there, sometimes it's the best teacher you can have in a specific thing. But when it comes to being well rounded, maybe not so much. Um, I, the, the hard knocks that you're like speaking of, that they, um, the truth of the matter is, is they um, weren't necessarily the best to their kids because they weren't around. Maybe they had, uh, and I say they, I'm talking about anybody in uh, the generation kind of before us coming up mm -hmm. that we learned under. Uh, not just uh, specifically L.A., um, but the sacrificing your own personal life, your own personal mental health, your family, your um, your own story for someone else's story instead of prioritizing like we're trying to do now. Change the whole game. Yeah, yeah. we were working on a, uh, a show called Geostorm and we were <laughs> oh, Geostorm. Geostorm. <laughs> God, did we like made so much money off of that show and it was so terrible. <laughs> yeah. It was, what, <laughs> like when you funny, watch it, there was like, a recent Geostorm. Yeah, wow. Oh, yes. And there was yeah. a recent Geostorm. Oh, yeah, 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 the yeah, last yeah. two nights I was it's, thinking yeah, about that. Happening. Right. That was it's still yeah. happening. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's your, that's your guy. Um, Oh, Jerry uh, B. Jerry B. Yeah. Jerry B. Yeah. Right. Jerry. Jerry. Jerry B. yeah. yeah. Uh, she's a butthead, as uh, we learned. Uh, yeah, that's what I call being a Jared, <laughs> Jared Butler fan. Oh, gotcha. But sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were yeah. on Geostorm, and we were talking to the lead plaster, and he was talking about how he, back in the day, was working under someone else, and he was like, oh, I have my kids school play or birthday party or, or whatever baseball game, baseball or... game. and it, it was an important event to him um and the lead that he was working on her admonished him and said i'm gonna fire you make your choice yeah make your choice and we don't live in an industry here like that anymore and we shouldn't and we shouldn't have to sacrifice our families to work in this profession and i think that's something that we more and more need to work towards and realize as an industry changing that culture changing that mindset of like oh no i just have to sacrifice everything for work no you have to like this is about working to live not living to work yeah and and uh, uh certainly i mean even going back 10 years ago not even 15 it was definitely still a lot in that mentality mm -hmm. where I, I'll, I'll just use underground because that's my go-to mm -hmm. is my worst show. And I've been very <laughs> honest about it, but, um, 
I sculpted on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we were averaging 15, 16 hour days on that show. Yeah. And, you know, we're shooting out in the wonderful world of Vachery. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, they didn't want to put us up because there's not a lot of options out there. So you're having to do these commutes back and forth to Baton Rouge and, um, and you know, in these late long hours and, you know, p accidents happen. Like, uh, I remember a PA got an accident. They were luckily okay. But you know, that fatigue and oh my God, I mean, a set PA, if we're doing 15, 16 hours, I mean, they're hitting probably 20 hours or something, yeah. you know, as Zoe is nodding very low. <laughs> yeah. And they're making less than anybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the amount of times that I've, I've heard the, when it's a really long day and then all of a sudden everybody's talking about their call time. Well, I've been here since this time <laughs> and I've been, I'm like, all right, it's a long day for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Gen Xer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We yeah. get it. You were here 45 minutes earlier than everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My fingers are more to the bone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, you guys, this is, this isn't a competition. We're all tired. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but that's also, uh, 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 we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. We mentioned in the intro, uh, that y'all are married. Um, and, uh, those long hours, um, being in a relationship, trying to balance your personal life, your work life and stuff like that. I mean, certainly, uh, it's a difficult thing, but uh, do y'all want to take a second to just speak a little bit to it? So we, um, yes. How do you do it? <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell me. Um, we're all taking notes. And, and, <laughs> Simonette and I are, um, like I would say built different, <laughs> um, just from the very beginning. Uh, it was, it was definitely love at first sight. And, um, like, uh, you know, you know, I told her she was the one on our first date before oh. we kissed, like, pretty much, uh, <laughs> may um, I ask, it, was it like, uh, she went to hand you a paintbrush and your hands touched? <laughs> well, actually what's, what's funny is we were, um, so, so spoken like a true okay. so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so, so here, well, here we go. Um, so, <laughs> so in between shows, I would go work at studio three for Jonathan Bercelli. And, uh, I was coming off of, uh, I think Percy Jackson reshoots or something. And I come in and, Simonette is uh, sculpting this nine foot clown out of clay on this ladder. <laughs> and this is, you know, I have not used to seeing this in the shop. And, you know, and I'm like, whoa, wow. You know, and I'd answered a Craigslist ad oh, for wow. a sculptor. That was, that's why we, I was we, there. We, we, have, we have talked about the Craigslist world on yeah. the show. So was that the favorite way to section? get jobs? Huh? <laughs> that's our favorite way to, to get jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like pre internet obsession, yeah. right? And, yeah. uh, and I was just like, man, uh, I don't know. Like, if she is as beautiful <laughs> in the front, <laughs> in the back, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess this up. I'm not gonna talk to her. <laughs> and and uh, and then and then she stepped down. Hi, how you doing? My name's Simonette. I'm like, oh god, oh god. <laughs> um, Dreamweaver and, started playing. Yeah, in your head. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then we worked. Uh, worked over there together, and uh, and I, you know, I barely talked. Yeah, to her. I gave him to ride rides to lunch all the time, and he would just be real quiet. Yeah, I just and try to and ask him questions. And, you know, I wasn't going to mess short it up. answers. <laughs> you know, you, you put your, put both feet in your mouth all the time, and you learn to be quiet whenever something good's happening. So, at one point, I said, uh, you know, are you interested in you know getting into film? And she said, yeah, I, I've, I've tried, and I, I've you know tried a couple times and gotten some work in, but it's just not sticking. And I said, well, we've got uh, the show. I think it's called Maze Runner coming up, and I'm oh, one wow, of the yeah. sculptor foreman, so I could probably get you on. And um, and we I we started up a couple months later, and I got her on. And then, of course, I was back in my element. So now I'm she's getting to see me. He actually talked. <laughs> you know, running around between departments and uh, full of energy. And uh, we had a really great time. Uh, Simonette and I ended up working on the actual main builds for the walls. Um, and we have what's called a hot wire, which is this, uh, it looks 
kind of like uh like long nunchucks with uh like a glowing uh, like laser in between them and <laughs> so the tension between us was real you know? uh, we literally have to keep tension on the hot wire in order to cut foam yeah. you know so we're always talking about tension and heat and like you know so we're, we're, lots of lots of innuendos that we weren't fully acknowledging at yeah, that point and, and you know, she was she was in the life change and i was i was in a life change and we were both mm-hmm. kind of ready for the relationship with while trying not to date Mm -hmm. while trying not to express our feelings while just being work partners and uh being totally cool about everything you know (laughs) yeah and uh one day uh i'm kind of messing with her and just seeing what you do in these big very light (laughs) blocks of foam i just kind of tilted one a little bit they're standing up it's like eight foot and it's like six inches thick. It's just a piece of foam. Mm-hmm. And it bumps against her. And she looks up at me with like, what do you think you're doing? And had just changed out this foam gun, like these pro foam guns, and just pointed it straight at my chest and like made a giant like cow patty on my chest <laughs> with this. It's and like was, great stuff. Yeah. 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 And I was like, oh wow, she don't take nothing from nobody. <laughs> I think I love her. <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah, t- <laughs> and uh and then we ended up going to french fest i mean not french fest uh, french quarter fest and uh just to hang out and that was our first date and we have pretty much like been um thick and thick thick and thick all the <laughs> way through and um through that we started spending a lot more time as uh s- combining our wants and our dreams uh on the first date um we were kind of playing this game with a group of her friends and it's called the tribe of yes <laughs> and they had invented it the weekend before at this festival and basically anything is to open you up and every you get this name and they had some face paint and they said for 24 hours you have to say yes to everything everything and <clears throat> sim sober so she was like well that's my one rule uh, please don't ask me to say anything, like, you know? And, uh, so we're, I'm thinking, and, and, uh, you know, I said, so you have to say, yes, is this apply to after the 24 hours? And she's looking at me like, uh, what is this dude going to say, man, you know, <laughs> yeah. guys, what are they, you know, they're always coming up with some kind of slick angle. And, uh, I God, I'm embarrassed to say this, uh, but, uh, <laughs> so I just looked at her and I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to ask, ask the question. I said, okay, shoot. What, what do you got? And I said, um, in all sincerity, I said, would you like to stay with me and help me serve the world? And uh, she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, and, and I really meant in just the way of like companionship and friendship, right. not mm-hmm. necessarily asking her to be my wife. Um, and then when I asked her to marry me, I actually <laughs> brought her a bowl of Ice cream. He, and- okay. Fast forward like two years. Um, <laughs> the next day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fast forward two years. He decided uh, to play the yes game again. Yeah, we decided <laughs> to play the yes game again. And he's like, I want to cook you dinner tonight. And let's, we had this. For, like when we first got together, we decided to move in because um, we had both been kind of like living on that show in Baton Rouge. And so we moved into this 425 square foot apartment on Magazine Street that was Ooh, affordable okay. in case one of us wanted to move out. We were trying to be practical, yeah, right? We were yeah. both in between yeah. places of living. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah. Like, well, we'll see if it and we didn't want it to be like too financially, you know, out of reach for in somebody. In case to move one out. of us had to take it over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> we ended up having this like great parade spot with a balcony on Magazine oh, Street yeah, yeah. for like Toth and all that stuff. Anyway, so he's like, oh, I want to have dinner out on the balcony. And, and so he made me dinner and then like dessert comes around. He's like, all right, I'm going to go get dessert. And, uh, he's in there for a while, like scooping ice cream, I guess. And, and like the working himself of, up. The pile <laughs> of ice cream. Her bowl was a foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a, a, a Ziggy Piggy or whatever? Uh, yes, 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 yes. That's yes, the first thing that popped um, in my mind. <laughs> a so, he, yeah. so he walks outside. Yeah, and I, and I give her the ice cream. He's like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Compared to your bowl, like, okay. Um, and I said, you remember on our first date, uh, I asked you about, you know, will you stay with me and help me serve the world? And she said, yeah. I said, I don't really care that much about the rest of the world. I just, I, I'm cool with just you and me. Yeah. You know, will you marry me? And, uh, and it was, it's been great. Um, 
uh, we get we get questioned a lot of how do you do it in work. Um, we're patient with each other, and we um, we don't really fight. We don't fight. We do a lot of cat staring <laughs> at <Yeah>. each other <laughs> um, at work. Because do you guys work together a lot? We used to work together all yeah. the time, yeah. and then our side we have a side business, Scenic Art and Casting mm-hmm. Studio that we do, um, and we just we just don't we don't like fighting. So. Mm-hmm. Um, as no one should. So if the resentment builds, you talk about it, mm-hmm. you try to express yourself in the best words you can. If you can't uh, express yourself in words right then, take a break, come back around, um, communication, compromise. Like these don't are you all find like, that's a funny question though, too. Like, how do you do it? And <laughs> the answer is always we communicate yeah. and we work well together. <laughs> yeah. Right. And we, that's, we, we do things that should be, and obvious. that's it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You either work well with your partner or you don't. But yeah, if you have a good yeah. partner, then you work well together. Right. Yeah. 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 Or else it's to- or else you give a BS, BS answer and then you're t- a temporary work relationship. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, I never dated anybody at work in film at all. And the one person I did, I married. Yeah. <laughs> in, and y'all, I mean, talk about playing with fire in the same department, nonetheless. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, usually the couples that, that you can see that have figured it out work very far away from each other. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, I think about Kristen and Chris, uh, you know, so you have a, a decorator, a set decorator and a, um, uh, and a key grip. So very little interaction between the two. Like they, they might be see each other on a tech scout at the beginning of a show mm-hmm. or something. And that's kind of it. So like that makes sense, but like you guys are definitely like, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you say, guys are crazy. <laughs> so, I I would never because I'll use props as an example. Like I I might like somebody in props, but then in my head I go, well, I guess I'll never be able to work with you again. So we'll always have to be on different shows. <laughs> like that won't mm. work. <laughs> yeah. We started out as fantastic work partners. Like yeah. we realized pretty early on that like we're one person maybe had a deficiency, the other person had a strength. Oh, that's cool. And so it really complemented, like, he's really incredible with, like, spatial awareness and, like, um, facilitation and, um, like, figuring out complex problems and finding things. He's a great part. Like, he'll know where anything is. Um, I'm great at losing things. It's my ADD. <laughs> ADD works in different ways. Yeah. Different I also have ADD. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and it complements each other. Yeah, right? yeah, which is, like, really fortunate. Um, um, and, and then I guess, you know, with me, I'm very much creative and like, I, I like to envision like the beginnings of projects, especially when we're working on our side business or even when we're working on a sculpture, like plan through things and, you know, uh, logistics and stuff like that. So that's so cool that I, I am a little jealous because it's, it's, I mean, just in general with relationships, I mean, finding somebody, you know, is a magical thing when you find that person that can compliment you and everything to do it in the way that y'all have done it is definitely a special thing and very rare. Um, but it's very cool that it's like a peas in a pod kind of thing, you know, that complimenting each other. I will say this. Um, there's a, there's a, you like a yielding <laughs> that you have to be willing to do at any moment for the person that you're working with or care about. Um, there's been op- opportunities for me to learn. And if I didn't yield to what she had to show me and I was, it was all about me, then I would never get to g- get that information and vice versa. And I think for, um, men, a lot of times culturally, uh, they want to either be, uh, someone that's a teacher or they want to be in some kind of power, uh, situation and, at doing the work is p- half the battle, like breaking down what uh, we've kind of been taught into uh, who's who and what's what, and just throwing that out and going, I can learn from anybody. Um, and I shouldn't like subject myself to be the one that's supposed to know things. And um, because the patriarchy tells me to basically, <laughs> but um, yielding is, one of the most important things and the give and take of learning. Cause we, we have worked a lot of like being actual work partners right next to each other. And then at times we've been in different departments. So we've had a little bit of everything to where we only get to have lunch together or we only ride home together or we're working on different shows. Cause we eventually started working for different crews mm-hmm. and then you don't see each other. 
And then the magic happens where you're like, oh, yeah, I know the dirt on this person. I know the dirt on this person on your show, on my show. And then our powers have combined. And, and it's, you know, it all has its benefits. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, um, since we're on the subject of it, um, uh, kind of tying it all together, uh, the long hours and everything. I, I, I used to have a joke about um, if you are going to find someone, date someone and you work in the film industry, go find a doctor, a lawyer, somebody that Mm -hmm. makes good money, but also has insane hours because at least you would understand each other's kind of crazy, hectic work world. But it, it, it's hard when in a relationship, if you're with somebody that's not in the film industry, not in some kind of other crazy hours, maybe they have a nine to five job or something, then suddenly you're in a very precarious situation that can get stressful. Um, and, uh, it, I think it's, it sort of funnels us sometimes. Uh, that because we're, we're, we're around the same people for so many hours of a day, you know, and you don't see someone on the street or in a coffee shop or something like that. Cause you've just spent, you know, 18 hours, uh, sleep deprived with the same crew. So, um, I think again, it's just a very commendable thing, but that's part of the reason why y'all are here today. Um, I want to ask, uh, kind of going back a little bit of what, when y'all were growing up and everything, what got you kind of on this artistic path that you both uh, ended up on? Well, um, both of my parents are writers, and so creativity was really nurtured um, in my household growing up. I was a very introverted kid, and uh, but I loved um, drawing and painting and making like little dioramas or big dioramas sometimes for book reports. <laughs> Like I would be the kid that like, oh, uh, you know, do like a creative project really. And I'd come in with this like big diet, like, oh, I'm ready for the book report. And like holding this giant, like, like, um, you know, replica. Yeah. Like replica of like the mice of Redwall, their Abbey, you know, like I was really into, I'm really into books. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then like visualizing those environments. Um, and then also carnival was a big, um, influence for me seeing uh the creativity that goes into carnival um like really inspired me from a young age um and i never thought i would get into film uh i knew i wanted to be an artist and a writer um and i went to noca for creative writing and and for the first year and then visual art for the last three years and then shout out to noca Oh God, yeah, Noka's we incredible. We haven't talked about them yeah. too much on the show. Yeah, it's like <clears throat> I was so grateful. I learned in many ways. I learned more at Noka than I did in my college years at Tulane. <laughs> you know, because it was such a well-rounded education, especially in fine arts, but also in creative writing. The first year I did there, I really enjoyed it. I just always found myself doodling in the margins and, you know, looking at the visual art kids and being like, "Oh man, I really want to do that." Uh, so. Noka was incredible. And then I went on to Tulane and I did a studio art major. Um, and I came out of college like, okay, I, uh, Katrina happened while I was in college. And, um, you know, it was a post Katrina, New Orleans, Katrina happened my junior year. And I traveled to Boston for one semester, which was like the semester where all the colleges all over America were like, oh, we'll take you guys for free for, you know, a semester, which was very kind. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> but it was like, you know, uh, but I went up to Boston for a semester and went to the Boston University Art Department and uh, learned a lot about sculpture up there. That's when it, where I really got some incredible training in sculpture. Um, and I had had some training at NOCA and some pottery training at Tulane. Um, but uh it, it was it was um, a whole different program. It was very much based on traditional fine art, anyway. Um, and so, coming out of college, you know, um, I, I graduated from Tulane, and and um, and then I was like, okay, what do I do? I want to be an artist. And you know, I'd worked in the service industry. I'd had a job since I was like fourteen, but I was like, I really want to figure out how to make a decent living as an artist. And um, I became a designer at a family fountain shop and a mold maker and a painter and, um, and then started my own faux finishing business. Um, and I started hearing more, more about the film industry over the next 10 years. And I spent like two years just trying to get in, 
you know, like trying to meet people because it, you really have to know someone, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, this was before programs like Novak where you could go and take classes. Um, and so I kept trying to meet people and I did meet someone from the film industry. Um, but I only worked on like a small show. Um, and it wasn't until I met Dave that I actually had an end to like work a union, a union show. Um, and so I came at it not really being a film person at all. <laughs> um, and I think about like the work that we do on the sets in a very artistic way. And you have to think about it fr- from a film way too, but it's definitely um, a great way to make a living as a working artist. And and uh, that's something that we like uh, exploring on the show because uh, kind of the ongoing lesson is that there's no one way to get in. Yeah. Like there's so many back channels and <laughs> random ways you can trip backwards in the industry. He has a mm-hmm. great story. Which, yeah, Dave, <laughs> what you got? Um, so uh, I, I grew up, you know, not having uh, access to a lot of things. Uh, college was not in, in um, my slot for life. So I did service industry, and I actually draw a lot upon service industry and in everything I do now. I'm more like a consider myself like a bar back mm-hmm. instead of a bartender. Yeah. I facilitate like a bar back. I, 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 I do a lot of my activities based upon that. Um, always trying to serve the customer. <clears throat> sort of backbone, I, right? Yeah, yeah. That's my mode of operation, basically, <laughs> my default. So um, I did some construction. And I was familiar with how to read a tape and how to build things, lay floors, all these kind of different little things to, to stay busy and to supplement my income. And at this one time, uh, I was working in a Mexican restaurant. A girlfriend at the time, uh, her family owned the restaurant, and I was there to help out. I'd done all the sign writing and the painting on the windows. We had a, a man that came in for lunch every single day, and he had this company named Fomit. And it was... It oh, was un- yeah. Okay. Yeah, did you know? <laughs> uh, 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 Post-Katrina Shreveport. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, Jason uh, White. Jason White. <laughs> wow, it's been a minute. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and they had done the Louisiana boardwalk and had, uh, you know, all that, the molding and all the artic- ar- ar- architectural stuff is out of styrofoam and it's cut with these hot wires on these tables and stuff. And then they stuck over it. Well, he had made a little sign for the restaurant that we were in and we put it in the window and he was finishing out lunch and I said, uh, when are you getting that, uh, what's it called? A CNC machine? When are you, when are you going to get that thing in? And he's like, oh man, I'm not worried about that right now. I'm working on a movie. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. What are, what are you doing? He's like, I'm running a whole crew of uh, sculptors on this movie called Year One. And I'm paying them $300 a day. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm ringing him out, you know, uh, like checking out his, oh, okay. his, his uh, ticket for the day. I was kind of hoping you were holding a plate and you dropped it in the no. shop. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my last little minute before he walks out of the door. And I'm like, I'm on. <laughs> and I said, uh, wow, that's really, uh, can I get a job? And he says, uh, can you sculpt? I said, I'm a motherfucker with Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> My kid was, uh, our son was little at that time. And, uh, and right about that Play-Doh age. And, and uh, I just so happened to have one of my coworkers and said, look, look at the windows. Dave did all the windows. He's artistic. And he said, come check it out. And I went down there. And I, I used to wear these stupid hats. <laughs> And I had this, I went through this Australian hat face. <laughs> like, a, like a Dundee hat? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, I bought the it. Sign the sign up yes. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had it down, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, I could. <laughs> and, uh, so you, did you walk around with like brush attached to you? Yes. You just literally come out of some bushes or something? <laughs> Tell everybody, this is not a knife. This is not a hammer. Um, so you played knifey spoon. Yeah. <laughs> I know what Zoe was thinking. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and when I walked in, he said, come look for a man named Tony. Well, the construction coordinator at the time was named Tony Latanzio. And Anthony, I call him Anthony, what he was talking about him as in Tony. So I go in, I'm looking at, the, it's got to be 80 foot long by 20 foot tall, like just walls of foam that they're, scar- they're sculpting all this like stacked stone. 
it's like a whole big operation, but I notice people on lifts, people with chainsaws, like people with hand tools, all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting back looking at where they're looking at me. I don't realize I'm supposed to be talking to those people and right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this works. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at me like I'm an art director because I have this stupid hat on. (laughs) (laughs) Shout out to art directors. (laughs) Noble professions. Quote, that's their quote. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I that's go into the construction coordinator's office and say, I'm waiting on Tony. And not realizing that I have no business being in that office. Well, I make friends with the payroll people, the buyer, all the people in there. I'm hanging out with them. And it's like a cool little and t- to the point to where I said, well, when is this guy coming back? Well, he's out at location. He's probably not coming back. And I've waited in there for like a, a couple hours and uh, just chatting it up with them. And then I was like, oh, all right, well, I guess I'm going to go. I walk right past the guy that I'm supposed to talk to like three times. <laughs> and he, he's, he had told me, he said, uh, look for this guy that's got a, I could have sworn he said a toboggan on his head. And I have no <laughs> idea what that means. And it's like, a, it was a cap. Yeah. But, uh-huh. Whatever, you know, I don't know caps and right. hats, right? I'm wearing this <laughs> Australian thing. Not my department. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm winging it. Um, and then I called uh, I called Jason White back and I said, well, I, I didn't talk to anybody, um, but I, I looked at it and I think I can, I think I can learn to do that. I came in um, the next day, showed up, introduced myself, and um, they were kind of shocked, like, it's not the way that you do things. And that's not, that show was definitely not the way it was a subcontracted crew. And it was Mm -hmm. like, they ended up changing construction coordinators. It was like a whole weird thing that I, you know, it's just a weird combination of all things that brought me into, I didn't know anybody except for this subcontracted phone guy. And, uh, when I met Anthony, um, I just, he said, okay, have you ever done any, this is a master sculptor and here I go just showing up and he's like, okay, you start at the very bottom of the wall on your hands and knees. Mm-hmm. And then there was another master sculptor, um, rusty. And he, uh, took me up in a lift one day with him. He says, I'm going to show you how to see it. I'm going to help you develop your eye right now. And if you, by the end of the day, if you're not getting it or whatever, you may not be able to get it, but here, and I saw it right away. And then cool. um, the way that they were making the walls were uh, transparencies from the art department, like really laying it out, like specific where each block goes, how it all fits together. And then um, there was a transparency that they had lost. I have a really good knack for recalling things that I see if it's if somebody says something about it, like I'm the finder. If I, if ever I've seen it, I can almost recall it if you like talk about it um and it was in this pile of old styrofoam rubble this clear transparency that i just walked by didn't think anything about it Uh, that that's a weird place for that Mm -hmm. and they're arguing about going up to the art department again for another transparency and who was going to go do it and i came by and handed it to him are y'all talking about this and anthony and the other guy that was like drawing everything i'll just turn and was like who are you? <laughs> and I'm the guy with the hat. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's exactly what they used to call me. There was, the guy a, with the hat. There was an infomercial, yeah. the guy with the hat. Yeah. And they used to call me that. And so that was the point when they started actually looking at me. Mm. And so uh, he, uh, my boss was like, here is a list of things that I'm looking for. And then, I started kind of repairing tools and then he started allowing me to stand behind him awkwardly because I was trying to look at how he's solving some of these problems because it's like Sudoku Mm -hmm. just with texture. And um, and I just listened when people would tell me something. And that basically comes down to like I developed like ways to survive. And, And the three rules are this. Be on time early. If you can be right. And mm. that way, 15 that, minutes early is yeah, on yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. On time is late. Right. <laughs> that's, that's what we're, we're trained. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And if you're there on time, 
consistently, chances are the bosses may give you a special little project because they know you're like, you know, humble and on time all the time. Have a great attitude because um, working 12, 14, 16 hours every single day around the same people breeds problems. It buys trouble. And if you can keep a smile on your face and keep a good attitude, then the bosses are going to remember you um, and be teachable. Like, you know, don't tell me what you did on the last show. Don't tell me what some other boss does because um, I'm, I also know that, you know, a boss is thinking, I know I'm being told to do this, this is a ridiculous way because we're not making a real thing. We're making a fake thing. And this person is trying to tell a story through light. And I don't want to hear about how, <laughs> um, how it looks in the real world because this person is not trying to make a real world thing. They're trying to tell a story through all these elements that they're given, right? These production designers, like, you know, it's a tough job in a, in a lot of shows. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of like did that and just hope that every single day I would be able to come back the next day. Now I never made $300 a day, that whole show. I made $150 a day. And we worked 12 and 14 hours a day. And it wasn't until um, that somehow it, I don't know what happened, but headhunters came down and basically cleaned out the show mm. and brought in uh, the Turk, Turk family. And, and they basically ran the rest of the show and everything went into production. And then my days started oh, six wow. months in. Huh. My days actually started then. Mm. Uh, and it was like, uh, I think it was 30 days back then. It went 30 days, 45 days, or yeah, yeah it was 90 and then 40. It was 30, 90, 45, and now it's 45. It was 90 when I got in. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Is it 45? Yeah, yeah it's 45. Yeah. Yeah. But it, huh. That just makes you that much more qualified and ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's what the 90 gets you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, well, a spoiler alert, uh, we're going to have, uh, have you on next week. I'm going to put that in quotes. Um, but uh, uh, the 90, I, I felt it was kind of like an experiment. And then everyone kind of went like, yeah, that's not really working for mm -hmm. us. And then it kind of just retracted after that. But I remember voting in that moment because I think the, the consensus at the time was we were swelling yes. uh, with numbers. Right. Um, and so you got so many people filtering into the industry or into, I mean, into the union hall. And, uh, and I, I just, I remember the sentiment at the time was like, we got to like slow it down yeah. or, you know, um, and here we are coming out of a strike situation <laughs> and then we're on the opposite end of the mm -hmm. pendulum, I guess. Um, before we get out of here today, uh, I want to, uh, ask each of you the same question and, um, and cause Dave, you already given some nice advice. So, uh, what I, uh, want y'all to speak to a little bit, uh, as far as your craft what are some things, what are some of the aspects of your job that you enjoy the most that, that gives you the most satisfaction in your, in your work world? Um, or maybe something uh, particular that you are proud of crafting on a show, anything along those lines? Um, I think one of the biggest points of satisfaction that I noticed early on was the opportunity for learning new things. Um, and that goes back to the three rules. I give the same advice that he does. We teach a mold making class now for the union. And, um, you know, those, those are great, great, you know, things to live by. Um, and the be teachable thing, uh, is especially important because you can always learn new crafts. Um, and you never know who your boss is going to be. It could be the person yep. under you. And then the next show, they're your boss. Yep. Um, and it happens all the time. And yep. you would never expect, you know, like the, the power shifts. And it happens, you know, throughout the industry. Um, but the, the different crafts that I was able to learn were really exciting to me. And being able to learn those crafts, I was able to jump around to different departments and learn different skills. I came in as a sculptor. Uh, and then I was able to become a scenic um, and develop my scenic skills and really learn from a lot of different skilled, incredible artists and, and craftspeople. And, um, and then I had also been learning mold making, uh, from Dave now before, and, 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 and then, and then, uh, you know, around others, um, you know, and then learning all these three crafts kind of simultaneously throughout my time and jumping around to the different departments, um, it became kind of a game to us to play Survivor on some of these big L.A. shows that came in town. I remember Terminator 5, um, we 
would show up. This was way before COVID. Mm-hmm. We would show up at the at the construction office um, with our resumes at like five forty five six a.m. on Monday morning, and with we had our portfolios in these binders, right, with all pictures of our work. And we'd be like, "Hi, we're ready to work. If you want to hire us." And somebody had spread some you know, rumors about us to the bosses and so they were a little wary of us. Um, and we finally, we finally ended up getting hired on the sculpture department. And, um, so we worked for a while in the sculpture department and then we got, um, kind of poached by the mold making department, um, on that show. Mm -hmm. And the mold making department had had a rule that they weren't really keen on like, you know, hiring women, um, uh, because oh there was a wife of a previous team member on a previous show that had caused some issues. Oh. Um, and, and so relationship drama, relationship yeah. drama, mm. you know, um, but, um, the, the lead mold maker, Dave Cohen ended up being this incredible person to work with and really passionate about new Orleans music. So we worked in the mold making department. We learned all this cool stuff. He had all this really neat equipment. Um, and we were always jamming out to great music. And then I was able to hop over to the scenic department. And so like that kind of hopping between departments was facilitated by learning all these different crafts and making friends with other people in film and being teachable, being like, I don't know this, but Hey, how, how do you make rust? Oh, what's that? Is that, um, leather dye like what (laughs) how does that work you know (laughs) um so there's like all these different just in the scenic world alone not to mention mold making which is uh like a whole um kind of a lost art um that more people should learn um and and sculpture as well there's so many different incredible nuances to the crafts and there's so many different opportunities to learn so that's probably my favorite um thing and then a favorite project i would have to say um we, uh, Dave and Carlos and I, uh, Carlos Savant and I made, uh, this giant tree on Salem. Um, and the art department had like three weeks to sculpt this like model that was about a foot high, it was um, 20 inches by 20 inches, yeah. mm-hmm. one inch. Scale. And it had been shipped from California and like ruined because it was oil clay. So they had to like redo it. And then we had 10 days. With with welding, and it was twenty one and a half oh. feet high by twenty one and a half feet wide, and so we worked these really long days. But we had so much fun making this tree; it was it was crazy. Uh, and um, you know, and we ha- actually had to make it uh, hollow on the inside so that uh, roaches could uh, movie roaches. Uh, you no can't roaches you, were you can't squish them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, I'm right. not going to be on set. They have for a this. wrangler and everything. Nope. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, but like, there was a hollow in the tree that we had to make so that they could come out of like the, the, the tree hole. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Yummy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. Um, I would say I would agree about the learning, uh, and it's almost like collecting you know, like Pokemon cards at a certain <laughs> point. It's like, I know how to do this task. I know how to do that task. I'm familiar with this. This is cool. And every single one, uh, especially if you're like a uh, neuro spicy, like we are, um, hyper focusing on things. <laughs> and, um, I think one of the one of the things where I'm at right now is uh, I'm just just started like I just took my first welding class, mm-hmm. so now I'm looking at all the welding hoods and all, this <laughs> stuff and all the you know, and I've talked to you know I'm not interested in taking over that craft as right. far as like working in the industry doing it, but I'm in, I'm interested in and it's a whole and, new aisle at Lowe's that you can get into, <laughs> know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like I set aside some some Christmas money for it. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's like everything in, um, learning these different crafts is like the, the progress within the craft of layering, whatever it is, whether it's sound, whether it's light, whether it's, um, whether it's just the different things that go into painting a set. Um, if you, if you get to about the 60% mark. Um, that's where I noticed like most artists have their existential crisis because mm-hmm. it's time to bring everything home. It's time to what you started out doing to bring it home, to make it sense, make it make sense. And, and you're out of that phase where you're starting something and it's exciting. And now it has to kind of make sense. And, you know, your fear of being found out as a fraud usually shows up at this point. And, and what happens when somebody from the art department comes by and sees it, you know, halfway done and they, you know, and in your fear of that. So I would say that uh, getting through that 
push and bring things home and just trusting the process of like what you've learned and how to get out of binds is really what makes you a professional, not being able to do it with one, one go. Um, the layering of, uh, all these different chemicals and then coming back and then saying, okay, well it's, it's good, but just one little flick of denatured alcohol will make it just kind of separate and all these little dots and it'll give it that like that realism that you need. And, and you can do everything all the way up to that point, but it takes that last little bit to kind of bring it home. And it's so much like that with everything we do with being patient I guess it's uh, often a trial by fire and there's lots of existential crises, but like you, that's, that's where you learn the, the, the most because you have to get yourself out of those crazy situations. Oh I love goodness. that all creatives think that they're frauds. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly talking about how it feels like a con. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just feels like a long con. Right. Well, you have to act like it's a con, yeah. right? You yeah. have to, yeah. in order to even get up out of bed sometimes, yeah. it's a, you have to believe in the con that you're producing and yeah. Yeah. Um, for, for both movie jobs and jobs with our, with our company, we've taken jobs that are like the weirdest things mm -hmm. that we do not know, like how we're going to make it happen, but we go, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No problem. And then we figure it out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of things, especially in the film world that you, you've never had to do before because there's strange, like things that people are requiring. It's of not you. consistent. No. Enough. Yeah. No. yeah. There's yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah. of crazy yeah. things yeah. like sculpt this weird looking demon, you know, mm -hmm. um, like make these giant walls, um, you know, mold this like really complicated spaceship part, uh, you know, uh, paint this strange mural. I mean, like all sorts mm -hmm. of different things. Yeah. yeah. And then, and since Sometimes it's the very last thing you do may be a little bit of sawdust, a little bit of carpenter's glue and a little <laughs> bit of green paint. And you just flick it from backwards, not even frontwards <laughs> at the wall. And it's like, oh, there it is. That's what the sells moss. it. The moss. And that's what people see. And then they're like, oh, yeah, well, it's it's easy if I just learn these chemicals or whatever. And it's 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 more than just that easy thing. It's making it look easy is like. Mm -hmm. the cool part but inside internally i think we're all freaking out if we're making a a, a difference in what it, it, the professional look at things and one thing that anthony told me early on when i was sculpting is like if you are getting into a groove and things are going too easy you're probably fucking up the whole thing <laughs> so you should probably <laughs> step back look at what you're doing and these are like mm. like things in I carry into my life, you know, step back, look at what you're doing, be thoughtful about it and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's really great advice. And, and also good closing advice. Um, cause we also usually end with advice. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, to Dave and Simonette, want to thank you both for coming in today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like I teased earlier, we'll see y'all in quotes next week, uh, where we're going to get into some union chat. Um, but anyway, thank you both for stopping by. Thanks All so right. much thank for having you. us. Thank you this so was great. All right. Thanks y'all. All right. Thanks again, Dave and Simonette for coming by. Uh, so what, what would y'all think initial thoughts, uh, about the paint world? Oh man. Or you say paint world. Well, scenic world, I should say. <laughs> you, so I guess, is that kind of where your brain goes? You, you, is, you, you kind of refer to them in your brain as like the paint world? Because, Just out of curiosity. I was, well, I, I would say from an art department standpoint, um, paint, because that's the largest tasks. section of that side of the scenic world, okay. yeah. uh, we tend to, to generalize it as paint. But um, as they were mentioning mold making, uh, plastering, scenic, uh, uh, sculpting. I mean, uh, all those are very specific skill sets. And so they're specialty jobs essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, so saying that someone is a set painter, uh, is just, and, and, you know, a very needed job. I'm not trying to downplay it or anything, but you know, someone would say doing a roller on a wall or a flat, uh, for a set or something like that. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that that same person can then come over here and sculpt. And so yeah. um, talking in, in terms of, say, Dave and Simonette, scenic would be the appropriate thing. I'm just as guilty as anyone. It's just generalizing as paint. Well, so. like on-set scenic <clears throat> yeah. is mostly 
painting. Right. right. You, you and, know what I mean? Right. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and what I used to say yeah. onset painter. I mean, yeah. onset scenic is sort of the more modern, like preferred way to say it. Yeah. Um, and that, which that's a, that we'll have to get somebody in for that. Um, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but there's the, the biggest way you can annoy any onset scenic is say, take this down 30%. <laughs> and because when you give percentages, one person's idea of percentages wouldn't necessarily be the same as another's. And so, um, uh, the hack that I worked for on underground yet another underground reference would always send me with stuff to the scenic and, and say, tell them to knock it down 25%. And I'm like, I, I've already mentioned that they don't like that. And so you, know, <sighs> you take it to them and I'll go, he says 25%. And they're like, what is 25%? And now they're upset and they're complaining and everything. I'm like, I, dude, I, know. I don't know. I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, and then, and then, uh, you go back to him with it and he's like, I thought I said 25%, you know, and it's like, you know what it is yet another Simpsons reference. I thought I told you to shave those sideburns mattingly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's too big. Uh, <laughs> um, that's what it is. Yeah. Different Simpsons reference yeah. for me, yeah. uh, but clink into the Simpsons jar. Um, I hate the percentage one. Yeah. I find that in props too, though. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Oh, well, it needs to be this size about, you know, yeah. which is a little bit more accurate, but it's also like, well, very subjective. Uh, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, right. Who the hell are you talking to? Yeah. I, I've got that in my world too. Oh yeah. For, for yeah. music playback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking it down about 25%. <laughs> That's true. What, what there's, we're talking volume. Yeah. And you're standing in the back of the room, <laughs> you know, I've also heard, uh, 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 effects with atmosphere. So they have the, the fog machines going and everything. And you'll, the DP will say like, uh, uh, you know, less smoke, take it down by half, you know? And it's like, what is half of smoke? Like so, half so, the so, smoke. What so do you mean? the direction for, for every department is take it down 25%. Who should actually be taking it down 25%? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I get it. Percentages are more universal, but they're still irritating. Yes. yes. Uh, there, uh, shout out to Donnie uh, FX. He was working fog machines on a show that the DP, I think he was Hungarian. Um, but it's just this yelling DP going more smoke, Donnie, less smoke, too much smoke, less smoke. Okay. Just right. <laughs> you know, it's like, mm -hmm. ah, that's very stressful. Um, but anyways, um, uh, let's see that, uh, da, 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 da. I wanted to, um, uh, cause we didn't really get into it that much, but the scenic world is part of the construction world and the construction world is underneath the art department umbrella and everyone ultimately like the, the top of that umbrella is the production designer. Um, and, uh, I, I realized we, we kind of glossed over that, but essentially the head of the, of that entire scenic world is the lead scenic. Um, and, uh, your painters are your scenic artists. And then you have your specialty positions, uh, such as they mentioned, like the sculpting, mold making, as needed on a show. Some shows obviously don't have those. Um, but if you imagine, just like construction, each of those things comes with foremen, gang bosses. The larger the, the needs are, the bigger the department, and then the more need for order and ranks, uh, rank and file. Mm -hmm. but, um, but that's generally, and then the onset painter, the onset scenic that we mentioned, but that's generally the scenic world. I'm probably leaving something out because we should have asked them that question so that's on me um i guess we'll just have to get another scenic person mm -hmm. um so let's see uh da, da, da. um wanted to ask you um uh one last question in regards to this um so uh do y'all have any well i guess we kind of talked about it a little bit but do y'all have any uh uh, set experience or maybe prop experience actually Zoe that you've been in relation to paint. Like you've been interacting directly with paint. Um, maybe you need something aged yeah. uh, specifically. <clears throat> uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we always try to get, uh, you know, our onset scenic to do stuff for us, but we've, we've had to paint stuff and age stuff. Um, unfortunately, because that's not my department, I have gotten the results that I wanted, but how I got there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? I use what's in the kit. I know what I want to see. Um, I, I somehow got there, but I don't know how, 
Mm -hmm. That sounds stupid. I sound like an idiot. Uh, you know, again, fraud, uh, (laughs) but yes, yes. I've, I've, I've painted stuff, um, age stuff, nothing crazy, obviously. Uh, that, yeah, that's yeah. a difficult thing in our in in our prop world is um some shows some situations they don't want to staff appropriately they don't want to pay for like uh, enough of scenics that might be needed or maybe they don't want to carry an onset scenic for the whole show mm-hmm. and it forces us into a very uncomfortable position because it's it's sort of a craft violation it's kind of a gray area but like if I'm in my shop and I'm doing my own aging and distressing and you know I'm, I'm knocking the shine off something or i'm making something look older and rusted i'm doing a scenic's job yeah. but i'm not a scenic and so i don't want to do it you're talking about if you're doing that to a prop yes correct okay. yeah um uh like maybe um Sometimes you don't want to bother someone, though, too. If you know what I mean? If you've bothered right. someone too much, you know for a fact that they're busy, you're not particularly busy, and it's like, yeah, whatever, I can buff off the shine yeah. uh, real quick. I can uh, cover this up. I can age this a little bit, blah, 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 you know? And, and, and if I, they have notes about it later, right. then we can address it then. Yeah, right. or fix it in post. You know? But, I mean, I, I've had some <laughs> scenics get upset because they'll realize, you know, like some props had been aged and they're like, who did this? You know, and it's mm-hmm. like, well, <laughs> we did, you know, kind of thing. And they're upset. And it's like, I, I totally understand being yeah. upset. I'm also in a precarious rock and a hard place because I can't exactly go to the UPM and go like, I can't do this. You need to staff appropriately. Like, I can't talk to them like that, especially if I'm not a department head. Mm -hmm. But even if I was a department head, all I can do is lightly nudge and be like, you know, we could really use some scenic help. Uh, It's really putting a lot of pressure on us. I mean, I could do that as a department head, but um, a lot of times we're pigeonholed into very uncomfortable situations like that. And, and, it isn't fair. Mm-hmm. It should be enforced. Especially if your boss is asking you to do something. Like, mm, yeah. I, you never, I hate being the person, that's not my job. Yeah. yeah I don't ever want to sound like that. I will know yeah. that something is not my job, well, but I'm not going to say that. Like, okay, yeah, copy that. I mean, the, happy I, to help. How do we keep <laughs> working in our world? By saying yes to things, you know? And so unfortunately, sometimes that comes with that territory that you got to do something that you're not, you know, thrilled about that's yeah. gonna sound really bad out of context i know i mean um, my whole life on set is a day of a day of saying yes right. you're not allowed to say no yes uh, yes yes yeah what yes. do they call that a tribe called yes sure that's what it was yeah yeah um uh let's see any final thoughts about the scenic world no <laughs> no it seems fun it seems really really fun to play with all those tools mm-hmm what I really want to play with is that, uh, what do you call it? The foot with the, what they used to cut. Oh, the don't we all? No, dude, I want to, yeah. mm-hmm. like, isn't yeah. that, um, like butter. Who's the guy? Like butter. <laughs> fuck. What's the movie where he's whipping it around? It's a Marvel movie. He's whip. Fuck. Iron <sighs> man two, the second one. Iron Man Mickey 2, Rourke. colon, the second <laughs> one. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Pure of heart. I that's what that one was called. <laughs> Mickey Rourke is whipping around those uh, right, fire. Right, right. Okay. No, you're that's correct. what I think of when I think I of just, I don't whatever the hell we're talking fire, about. I don't know how to explain it. Fire nunchucks. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that. Yes, I, I want one. Uh, <laughs> I want to play with it, but it's probably not safe. Shit yeah. scenic is what I wanted to get into uh, before even getting into film, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Those I mean all that all that stuff seems super fun. I I I yeah. b- before I was in the film world, I I did some welding. I was a, I was a welder yeah. for nice. a few years. So yeah, I think if I if I hadn't gone into sound, it would have been something along those yeah. lines. Dude, sometimes their offset hours can be way crazier than being yeah. on set though, working the weekends mm-hmm. and yeah. against the clock to have a set ready. Basically, yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, yeah. again, peek behind the curtain. Uh, Dave was working today and had to like sneak out of work. Uh, I hope I didn't just get him in trouble. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is they work this crazy is a hours, weekend and yeah. they have to have a set ready Monday, and so mm-hmm. uh, that happens. Sometimes departments are on top of each other trying to get a set ready. Um, you can have construction, paint, set deck. Um, who else? Maybe greens all on top of each other on the same set trying to rush to get it ready. Yep. It's not a fun situation to be in. Uh, I've it's a noble it. profession. <clears throat> that all, is often uh, unseen, unseen mm-hmm. by a lot of uh, onset 
uh, crew unless People, you're yeah. in prep or you also work offset. You, you're not really, uh, yeah, completely understanding what they do, but there's, yeah. there's remnants of those, uh, you know, giant, uh, departments as, as we're rolling into set, there's few people that are leaving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, my friend is a, um, uh, scenic painter and, uh, he, <laughs> he said that when he's on, when he's on set with crew, uh, uh, on set crew that they just walk, they walk, they run away from him. Like he's the plague, you know what I mean? <laughs> looking at him covered in paint, looking like shit. <sighs> he's that monster, <laughs> you know, is how he feels. Uh, Oh, man. Well, we also know they're getting off of, they're usually getting off of work. They, they had just worked yeah. you know, for a long period of time. So we don't want to bother. Them. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. like as, as they're leaving, we're coming in. Don't say something like who painted this shit. It looks like a crap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> y'all have a good day. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, everything always looks fantastic. I mean, that, that's the thing about the scenic world is that like I have, I could definitely count on one hand how many like not so great scenic jobs I've seen. Like they always, I mean, they're, they're a home yeah. Run yeah, department. It's, it, yeah. yeah. You usually walk in and, and you feel that kind of like that, that magic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That, that yeah. Hollywood magic. They, yeah, yeah. When you're on set, like alone for some reason, your first person, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking of feeling like a fraud, sometimes seeing those set and seeing, uh, seeing the sets and seeing someone coming off a set after they've been working on it, it's just like, Oh shit, you, this looks like you work way harder than me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh, this is like a beautiful work of art. Yeah. Here's here's the rubber ducky you need for the next scene or whatever. Right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <The rubber ducky. laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what the fuck am I doing? Are you are you doing a Bert and Ernie movie? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. That'd be cool. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I can't cool. wait for that to come out. Now that I said it out loud, I'm like, actually, I'd work on that. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> dope. A puppet, All Muppet right. World, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, um, let's get out of here. And, uh, well. I need that? to say what I need to say. You look like you've gotten something to say. <laughs> say it. <laughs> One, two, better not suit. We want to hear from you, the audience. Do you have a behind the scenes story? Maybe you work in the industry or maybe you had a run in with reduction. You know, you live in New Orleans, New York, whatever, and some PA stopped you on the way to work and it was annoying. We want to hear about it. We want to hear about all of it. We love all the stories. Write us and maybe we'll read it on the show. Or maybe you just want to tell us that you love us or you really hate us and you want to fact check us because we're wrong about a lot of things. You can troll us, whatever you want to do. You might even want to guess where Joe or Chris are on any given day of the week. Uh, you can do that by emailing us at filmfolklorepodcast at gmail.com. It's filmfolklorepodcast at gmail.com. We do indeed want to hear from you. You can also find us on the social media. Instagram is Film Folklore Podcast. Facebook group is Film Folklore. Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, at The Film Folk. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us. We really want to hear from you. It's very important to us. Again, we work in the entertainment business, so we need a lot of validation. We're very pathetic, sad people, and we just, we really want to be reviewed. We want to know your honest opinion, and it means a lot to us, because you guys mean a lot to us. And for any of you that really like us and have some change burning holes in your pockets and, ha you know, just any money at all, like a credit card, we set up a donation with PayPal and Patreon. Links are in the show notes of this episode and our website. Money helps us do more fun things and we want to entertain you. Money helps you do more fun things, which helps us do more fun things, which is also helping you have fun. And it would be really nice. And we love you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.